from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It's my pleasant task to begin this afternoon's program about the crafting of the magnificent five-volume A History of the Book in America by presenting to you a familiar face who has served as the general editor for the entire enterprise, David D. Hall. With Hugh Amory, David also was the co-editor of the first volume, The Colonial Book in the, American, in the Atlantic World, excuse me, which was published way back in 2000. David has taught at the Harvard Divinity School since 1989 and was Bartlett Professor of New England Church History until 2008 when he became Bartlett Researcher Professor. No one knows more about the series, which is why he is the perfect person to chair this celebratory discussion with several members of the editorial board. David, I know it's been a long journey from the colonial book in the Atlantic world <laughs> to the enduring book in the modern world. So I congratulate you and the American Antiquarian Society for undertaking such an ambitious and important project. We're eager to hear the reflections of you and your board members. Welcome. If you thought that uh, Ellen and Sid had gotten shorter, it's only because I surreptitiously cranked this podium up as high as it would go <laughs> so that I can actually see my comments. <laughs> and I do want to make one uh, modest uh, emendation of uh, Sid's remarks. In 2012, we're looking forward to the re-election of a president. At least I am, <clears throat> and I know you are. It's a pleasure, a special pleasure, to be here today and to be in the company of so many of you who have participated in this project. I should say that we also want to begin by thanking the Library of Congress and the Center for the, Center for the Book here at the library, and John Cole in particular, for their support, John's support, personal support, and the center's support uh, over the years and for, in effect, serving as a co-sponsor of this particular forum as well as for the annual, the semi-annual meeting of the Antiquarian Society. This was a project, and this is a gathering of people whom we might term the resolute, the committed, and the stubborn. <laughs> stubborn as in the sense of telling someone, you will get this done, <laughs> or stubborn as in the sense of, I'm not gonna revise this darn thing anymore, <laughs> which might be, have been the sentiment of some of you here and those on the panel. This is a gathering, too, of folks who have aged a bit since we began to meet as an editorial board back in the 1980s when Philip Gura gave his uh, 20th anniversary Wiggins lecture in 2003 at the American Antiquarian Society, a retrospective of the history of the book, he remarked that as he had turned over the pages of our newsletter, the book that began back then, that he had noticed, one of the striking things he noticed was that John Hench and I had gotten older. <laughs> we, we appeared in a lot of these uh, photographs of Wiggins lecturers but the good news is that though I now have white hair, it's not because of the history of the book. It's only because I himself indeed am older. The heart of this uh, program now is a panel that, in which I'm going to participate and has three other members whom I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, and we're going to reflect retrospectively, prospectively uh, on the history of the book in America and on our series itself. And I hope there'll be time for some interventions, as the French say at the end of the program, at, as we're finished speaking, we're, we're hopefully not gonna take up uh, all the time. But before that happens, before I and my colleagues speak and you speak or respond, I have the very, very agreeable task 
of saying thank you to some particular people who are here today or perhaps uh, not here today. Everyone I'm gonna name deserves a rousing round of applause, but I want to ask you to hold your applause until uh, the very end, party for uh, time's sake. In the beginning, as it says in a very old book, there were in the beginning, as it says in a very old book, there were two of us who by chance sat together at one of the annual dinners of the Colonial Society of Massachusetts, myself and the then director and librarian of the American Antiquarian Society, Marcus McCorrison. To the few words I said over the brie of that event, always a very noisy event, to the few words I said about the French Histoire de Livre, into Marcus's ear, he was immediately responsive. And within months, if not weeks, the wheels were beginning to turn at the Antiquarian Society, a conference being organized, a little later the Wiggins lecturer, Lectureship uh, instituted, the concept of a multi-volume series broached and endorsed. So it is fitting that I offer a particular thank you to Marcus for the support he gave the project, unwavering support, although not uncritical, as anyone who has ever worked with Marcus <laughs> would realize and even <laughs> realize and welcome. Without that support, there would be no, there would have been no program in the history of the book in America at the Antiquarian Society. Without that, with, with all the benefits, from my point of view, that it has brought to the society, Without that support, none of these books would have been written. Uh, if Marcus had turned a deaf ear to my few semi-coherent words that evening, uh, I would have turned my own energies elsewhere. Historians always have too many things to do. So we owe a great deal to Marcus and his alertness and commitment and patience. Second, and second only in the sense of following after Marcus, comes John Hinch, who became responsible for educational programs at the Antiquarian Society about the time all this was getting underway. John was truly the faithful shepherd of this project in a host of ways. And I count as one of the great pleasures of my life the partnership that we created, a partnership in which I knew I could always count on John to listen, to weigh, and when a decision had been reached and tasks laid out to put the full force of his skills, of his considerable intelligence behind those tasks to make things happen. The summer seminars, the conferences, the early incarnations of the newsletter, the negotiations with our first publisher, the preparation of grant proposals, all this fell to John to initiate and carry out. He did so with consummate skill. No publisher, no series. I am grateful in retrospect to Andrew Brown of Cambridge University Press for his willingness to come to Worcester and to meet with me in England and without knowing any of us more than casually to arrange for Cambridge University Press to be our publisher but our far greater debt is to the University of North Carolina Press for embracing the series and really embracing the series after we had to dissolve our relationship with Cambridge. So to Kate Torrey, is Kate, where is Kate? Kate Torrey and to David Perry, and David, I can't see because of the lights in my eyes. David, you're sitting, where is David? David's not here. Uh, to, to Kate Torrey and to David Perry, I offer the warmest of thank yous for your efforts on behalf of the series, a series that in every way exemplifies the high standards of one of the leading academic presses in the United States. And for those of you who have had the pleasure of working with David Perry, I'm sorry to say that in his absence here, I want to commend him for his diplomatic skills <laughs> with editors and contributors and even with the general editor Rough spots seem to vanish when he applies his healing touch. 
And, as, and here I want to say too that uh, we owe a thanks to Philip Gura, who knowing of our impasse with, uh, with uh, Cambridge said, well, I'll get back down to Chapel Hill, I'll have a little talk with North Carolina. So Philip, we owe you a debt of gratitude for being the intermediary and putting your, your influence and wise counsel to, to bear. No publisher, no series, but there would also be no series in the full sense of the term if Ellen, who succeeded Marcus, had not given her unwavering support to the project. And this, I want to say, was not something to be taken for granted. So it was an immense relief when Ellen indicated that come what may, AAS would stand behind the project. And at a crucial moment, Ellen put her finger on the scales. Actually, I've written here, put her fist on the scales. <laughs> <laughs> and with the support of the council, said that it was time for the series to be brought to a conclusion. So before my very eyes, or our very eyes, Ellen the watchdog mutated into Ellen the sheepdog, <laughs> rounding up the strays to ensure that in 2010 we can in fact celebrate the conclusion of the series. So thank you, Ellen. And there's a great deal more to say about the Antiquarian Society and its staff and about one staff member in particular, Caroline Sloat, who became untitled, really, the managing editor of the series, keeping track of a zillion, a zillion aspects of the project to which she herself has demonstrated the most complete form of loyalty. There lingers in my mind uh, for various reasons. The Labor Day weekend of September 1997, when with myself, Hugh Amory, Russell Martin, Caroline worked nonstop throughout the three-day weekend to bring volume one to completion, a typical gesture on her part. She was a very, very good person to worry with, but not to worry about. I come finally to the co-workers who made each individual volume possible, those who served as volume editors and those who wrote chapters or parts of chapters. In a moment, I want to ask all of you who served as contributors and editors other than the three who are at the panel to stand up and be acknowledged. And at that time, I hope we can uh, acknowledge them by a round of applause. But I want to remark uh, that one of the editors did not live to see this day. Sorry. My co-editor, Hugh Amory. And it's important for me to say publicly again what I've said in various other settings, that Hugh was one of the best teachers I have ever had. Uh, I had the enormous benefit of learning from him steadily, someone who is really remarkable intelligence, whose unrivaled knowledge of books uh, and irascible intelligence as well, played an immense role, an immense role in shaping the first volume of our series and in influencing other volumes as well. I want also to recall the moment when we decided to expand the series from its initial three volumes, stopping in 1877, to come down to the present. And at that moment, we had to reach out, and, in, and uh, at, a, at a later moment in the project, we had to reach out and solicit people who would come on board to a project that was already underway. And it was great that we got for volume four two people who can't be here today, uh, Carl Kessel of Brown University and Jan Redway of Duke. Then for volume five, it was just absolutely extraordinary that David Nord, Joan Rubin, who's part of the panel, and Michael Shudson came forward to do the near impossible task of figuring out a story, and lining up contributions, and doing the background work to make sure that we could cover the last half of the 20th century. And as for Bob Gross and Mary Kelly, it sometimes feels as though we were joined at the hip. We've been doing this for a long time, and my friendship with both antedates this project. Nor was it in doubt that Michael Winship would join us, or Steve Nissenbaum, and then after a while, uh, Scott Casper, who's participating, and Jeff Groves. And it is worth noting that the volume, the four of them co-edited volume three, has won, is the only volume of the series to date to have won a significant prize. 
Let me just say here too that uh, the, the editorial board included two people who did not uh, edit volumes, uh, Philip Gurr, whom I've already mentioned, and then the person who may single-handedly have written the most pages in our series, namely James Green at the Library Company of Philadelphia. So I'd like now everyone who contributed, I can't name all of you, there are lots of you here. I, I, I could see you, I can see Barbara Seisherman and I can see so forth. So I, but if you would all stand and if the volume editors who are in the audience would stand and let's give them all a round of applause. I'm sure all of you feel the same sense of relief that I feel. Two more, two more brief comments here before I do a couple of substantive remarks and then, then turn to others here. The history of the book is an international field of study. And our own project came into being, as some of you know, came into being in a sense in response to the then two other national histories of the book, one virtually complete, the other actually still in progress. Uh, the French Histoire de l'Edition Française, and the, the, history, the Cambridge history of the book in Britain. And it's worth recalling that we benefited, we collectively, all of us, from Marcus onward, benefited from the counsel and indeed the participation of Ian Willison and of Roger Chartier, both of whom came to Worcester at various points. Roger Chartier was going to have been a contributor to volume five, but his, his part had to fall to the cutting room floor when the volume got to be too long, and he graciously accepted that uh, fact. Uh, and um, so I want to just say here that we have benefited from something that's not common in American scholarship, not common in American scholarship, to have an international dimension to our work. And I'm pleased to report that two of the general editors of the British series, uh, Ian and David McKittrick, wrote me on behalf of their board to congratulate us on the completion of their series. So I pass on to you uh, their congratulations. I want to really be personal here and just say that when I think of the American Antiquarian Society, I think not only of the people I've named, Marcus, John, Ellen, Caroline Sloat, but I think also of the other people on the staff, Gigi, uh, Joanne Shazen, Nancy Burkett. Nancy Burkett was really, for me, when I was a fellow there in 1981-82, a kind of a key doorway to the riches of that society. I want to say that this entire project has also been a project rooted in the immense skills of the curatorial staff, unparalleled, un without rival skills of the curatorial staff of the Antiquarian Society. So they too deserve a round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> now I put some questions to the panel, which I'm actually gonna ignore. And uh, let me just say that uh, Mary Kelly is at the University of Michigan and a wonderful historian who actually, her first book was, before the history of the book had a name, was in a sense on, on female authorship in America. Uh, Scott Casper, where are you, Scott? What? Not uh, Los Angeles, right? Uh, no, where, no, where? Las Vegas, yes. Uh, Reno, again, uh, 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 Again, an unusually gifted uh, a scholar, uh, and then uh, Joan Rubin uh, at the University of Rochester. Uh, all three of the people that you're looking at here, and I, I might even put myself in that company, that distinguished company, are people who are trespassers. They don't work within narrow disciplinary binding, uh, boundaries, and that has been crucial to our project. The, the obvious boundary between history and literature doesn't matter. The boundary between kinds of history doesn't matter. And so we're, we'll get some glimpse of that here in just a moment. But let me just begin with a couple of backward reflections on volume one. And, and in a sense, what, the, what I might say were the accomplishments or the arguments of volume one. The one that came to my mind first when I was uh, making, think, putting together these remarks is that volume one demonstrates that book history does not need to be attached in all of its phases to the word new. In this sense, the reading tastes of Americans in the 17th and 18th century was extraordinarily traditional. The same kinds of books sold again and again and again and again. 
religious books, devotional books, Bibles, and the like. This would not be a surprise to, to almost everyone here in this audience, but there's such pressure, there's such pressure to discover what is new, what is different, what is changing, that to record again and again and again the persistence of certain kinds of reading, the persistence of certain practices of readings, the persistence of certain actual titles is actually very much worth doing because that is, in fact, what the reading history of the American people in their colonial and early national periods was. And the, the British historian, the British economic historian, William St. Clair, has made a larger argument of this in terms of the reprinting of books, which of course was less expensive for publishers to do in Britain because there were no fees to authors. The reprinting of books that were out of copyright or not be considered worth anything was a huge part of the British book business, as it was also here in this country. So it's a strange thing to begin with conservatism, as it were, the conservatism in a small c here. But it's important to remember that that conservatism then intersects, secondly, with arguments that have been made. It, to me, it was uh, probably the most delicious single moment with volume one came in James Green's essay on the, printing, the book trades in the middle colonies when he pointed out that after Benjamin Franklin printed an edition of Pamela, the largest book he printed in his entire career as a printer, the longest book he printed in his entire career as a printer, he never printed another novel. Why? Didn't sell. Yet a major literary historian, I won't say his name, a major literary historian had previously seized upon this event to say that the age of fiction had dawned. The age of fiction had dawned just with this one artifact. This is where book trade's history is critical, critical, done well is critical to making sure we don't make over inflated claims for rapid transitions. And the third point I would make here is about the public sphere. I happen to work primarily in the 17th century and in the 17th and in 17th century studies in Britain, Britain, France, Germany, the United States, the phrase of public sphere is like kudzu. It's just spread everywhere. And anybody who is anybody wants to attach him or herself. Oh, I'm writing about the public sphere. <laughs> and uh, we, we face this question in volume one. Were we or were we not, Hugh Emery and I face this question in volume one. Were we or were we not going to orient volume one around the public sphere? There didn't happen to be much of a, at the time we were do, uh, addressing this question, there didn't happen to be a whole lot of scholarship up specifically about early America in terms of the public sphere, but there it was like the siren song. You know, just take hold of this term. Each of us agreed that we would take a fairly disenchanted view of the term public sphere, which dates, by the way, from the work of the great German uh, philosopher and social theorist uh, Jürgen Habermas. The fact that it's in German makes it easier for the Americans and English to just say whatever they want to say because they don't have to worry about the German. Um, so that's what we did. That's what we did. Yet I wish in retrospect that we had taken the term a little more seriously because the public sphere is, in a, way, is a way of talking about political participation. And it's really crucial for us to understand the different modalities of political participation as these are linked to different modalities of the media. It's really a very important question, how those two intersect. Whether there's a necessary logic between the two, you know, one form of media generating another form of participation. That's a question that I think remains open-ended. You could argue it in a number of different ways. But in terms of what is not in volume one, and no volume has everything in it, what is not in volume one is a measured, serious concern for public sphere. You can piece together parts of it, piece together parts of it from Charlie Clark's excellent chapter on newspapers joined with Dick Brown's, who's right in front of me here, Dick Brown's discussion of the changing uh, dimensions of censorship of the press or freedom of the press, or from James Green's comments or from other parts of the book. You can piece together parts of this, but it's not something we addressed explicitly. So it fell off our agenda. And that is not uh, correct, I think, that in retrospect, we, we should have addressed that question. And finally, I want to, uh, Joni has tipped me off on what she's going to talk about, and so I'm going to steal a little from her. <laughs> Can I steal a little from you? The, uh, the history of the book, the history of the book uh, is uh, essentially about 
all the things that happen when a book is made or a newspaper is printed or a magazine is constructed. Lots of actors take part in that process. And the great achievement of our series is to make visible some of those actors. Not all of them, but most of them are there, they're visible. So that we proclaim in literary studies, people proclaim the author. The author writes a book. Well, as Hugh Amory would say, no author ever, pub he, authors write a manuscript and somebody else turns that manuscript into a book. And in that process, all kinds of things happen, more so in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries that may possibly happen today, but all kinds of things happen. And so a premise of our series has to be, has to have been, and is all the ways in which mediations occur around texts. There's no such thing as an unmediated text from the paper that's used, the pen that's used, the form of type that's used, the kind of paratext that's there. And uh, the history of the book has a great future, and our series has a great future because we helped bring that, ma make that clear to all of us. Finally, I want to say that uh, I said to Kate Torrey at, a, at an event yesterday evening, I said, uh, uh, how would you feel about entering into a contract with me to edit a new history of the book in America? <laughs> and I said the only problem is I would have to live to be 100 to complete that series. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, David, for the generous introductions and for being our leader. I'd like to say at the very outset that uh, I so, I'm so very glad that uh, David spoke about Hugh, about Hugh Amory. He defined for me what grace and generosity mean in a human being. And as I observed him and David working together, I was always so taken by the creativity in their partnership and the lilt and laughter that they shared together. And I can remember that as volume one came to a close and we had our final meeting when it was basically, I think it was in page proof or it was in, you know, it was ready to go to copy editing. And I said to Hugh, I said, this is a remarkable volume, Hugh. It is so remarkable. And he looked at me and he said, well, you know, David has very high standards. <laughs> that is true, absolutely true, as we all discovered. And Yet at the same time, I think it does speak to what Hugh is and remains today in our memory and remains very present to us at this particular meeting today. I want to talk um, about volume two, and um, we're going to be doing this chronologically, so I'm going to be talking about an extensive republic, print, culture, and society in the new nation, 1790 to 1840. And my presentation is very much at two levels. It is multi-voiced. It was with the counsel of the full editorial board and our general editor, David, that Robert Gross and I conceptualized this particular volume. And I want to also say that this is very much a double-voiced presentation, that Bob and I are both speaking here in a sense. And I want to express on both of our parts how deeply we indebted we are to all 32 of our contributors who were working with us throughout to make this volume truly a collaborative enterprise. I also want to note that Bob and I worked very closely with each of them at every stage of the process, refining conceptualization of the volumes, shaping the organization of the chapters, recruiting the contributors, working with the, those contributors, and building and revising their drafts and their copies, sometimes more than they would have preferred, I might add. But it was and remained throughout very much a collaborative enterprise, and Bob and I go great debt to them. and. Um, we owed, in a sense, a real debt to each other for moving through as we did um, and sustaining a wonderful friendship. Uh, David asked us, and then, of course, he did not address them, but he did, <laughs> but he did ask us to think about four questions. I'm going to be um, addressing two of those questions. One of them was, um, how will an extensive republic, print, culture, and society in the new nation 
make a difference in how we understand the decades between 1790 and 1840? Or phrased a little differently, what are the contributions that volume two makes? I'm going to be talking about this, and then I'm going to talk about the second of these four questions that I'm going to address, which is interventions. But in this part where I'm talking about contributions, I'm going to talk about two, I think, central contributions. I could talk about virtually every essay in the volume, and I'm not obviously going to be doing that. But I'm going to talk about two particular sets of concerns, institutions, and secondly, reading and writing practices. Let me begin with institutions. And I'm going to talk, as, as David did, about the book trades. And I want to acknowledge now Jim Green, um, who wrote an absolutely path-breaking essay for us, and who demonstrated that in this period that the book trades were central. And yet, and until we had his presentation in that particular chapter, there was basically a lacuna between the local colonial printers described so well in volume one and the national industrial book, which was the subject of volume two. What were those in the book trades doing between the 1790s and the early 1840s? Were they dithering? Were they waiting for the technologies that produced that industrial book? They were not. And what Jim has been able to demonstrate, beginning with a basic contradiction is why and how the rise of publishing occurred. Let me begin with the paradox. That rise in publishing was one of the fruits of independence, but the trade itself was built upon the foundation of British books. Independence had not changed the basic fact that London was the center of the English language book trade and culture, and in the years immediately following the revolution, Americans continued to rely on imports from London, Dublin, and Edinburgh. In the late 1780s, however, printers in almost every state did begin to reprint British books in order to replace them with the imports with what they called native manufacturers. This was the American book as they defined it. Again, a central contention of the history of the book. Who makes the book? These printers were making these books. The next couple of decades were decades of struggle, of oscillation between failure and success. But as Jim demonstrates, by the 1820s, they were able, firms such as for example, Carey and Lee in Philadelphia, Harper and Brothers, brash newcomer, were able to take the first steps toward putting the trade on a fairly sound financial foundation and creating a distribution system that reached growing markets in the West and the South. These firms were also able to have mutually beneficial relations between American writers and publishers. This had begun in the 1790s, it faltered, and for the first time, they were publishing new American books as an important part of their trade. What James Green shows us then is that the trade developed from almost nothing in the decades from 1785 until the late 1830s. He also demonstrates, and this is crucial, that it developed before most of the broader economic, social, and cultural transformations that are usually associated with the rise of publishing took place, before the first great flowering of American literature, before publishing was centralized in New York, Philadelphia, and Boston, before the emergence of a national mass market of readers, before the railroads became a major force, and before there were more than modest improvements in the technologies of transportation, communication, and bookmaking. What then did this world of print look like? It was expansive and decentralized. It was local and cosmopolitan. It was a world in which printing and publishing expanded and a variety of publics provided a ready market for novels, for almanacs, for newspapers, for tracts and periodicals. A world in which through laws and subsidies, state and federal government provided for and, and promoted very much an informed citizenry, a world in which voluntary associations launched libraries, lyceums, and schools, and relied on print to spread religion, redeem morals, advance benevolent goals. And yet, and this I think is a central contribution, in a far-flung nation, volume two demonstrates that regional differences persisted 
and older forms of oral and handwritten communication offered alternatives to print. Here again, I'm echoing what David said about persistence and continuation more than transformation and the new at every moment. It was then a world of mixed media. And it was an important world in the sense that it was sui generis. It was there, and then matters happened after. But it's very much worth and needs to be understood in its own right. Also, in terms of reading and writing practices, I'm going to talk about two of those today. I want to talk, first of all, about, again, a, a popular trajectory and one that um, at least our volume in the history of the book uh, proves to be much more complicated. That is the supposedly straightforward arc um, from oral to scribal to print as you move through. And this is supposed to be uncomplicated and to be occurring at all times, supposedly, especially in the modern period. But there are some very real exceptions to that, as we demonstrate. For example, and I'm glad that Dean Grodzins is here today, because his and Leon Jackson's essay on practices at co uh, male colleges demonstrates, as does my essay on female academies and seminaries, that like their counterparts in the nation's common schools, students were immersed in oral and scribal culture. Day in, day out, students listened to their teacher's lecture and then stood before them and recited passages they had committed to memory. In literary societies, they debated issues ranging from female education to Indian removal. They penned and performed essays, dialogues, poems, and songs, which they circulated as manuscripts. Increasingly in the decades after 1820, they coupled oral and scribal production with print publication. Students themselves were the publishers. Those cultural productions that had originated in their literary societies appeared in student-initiated magazines and newspapers. And then, I recall that when Bob and I began the project together, we were all meeting as an editorial board. And David and Hugh were completing that first volume. David's counsel to us about a central scholarly debate, the reading revolution. What David said to us is, there's a shoe waiting to drop, and it's in your decades. <laughs> Had there been a reading revolution? Had there been a shift from intensive to extensive engagement with print, as many scholars have posited? Had Americans in the decades between 1790 and 1840 moved relentlessly from concentrating on a relatively small number of Bibles, devotional works, and almanacs, and focusing intensively on those steady sellers. Two, a 19th century avalanche of titles and genres and perusing them extensively to keep pace with the outpouring of magazines, books, newspapers. That shoe, David was right, as he is, dropped. And it has now dropped. And in Bob Gross's dazzling essay, we discover a much more complicated and I might add fascinating tale we learn that the explosion of print notwithstanding, older modes of expression and communication in small scale, face-to-face -face settings of everyday life persisted. Print intersected with those modes, and those modes remained key to the construction of identity and community in our decades. Individual readers lived in this world of mixed media that included composition and circulation of manuscripts, oral performances, and word of mouth. Instead of choosing one or the other form of communication, individuals combined the older and the newer approaches depending on the types of reading they were engaging. It seems that I'm the second person to bring up the case of the novel or the case of fiction, but there it is. Take the case of fiction, which many have presumed to be, have led the way to be the engine behind extensive reading. And some people have lamented this. In fact, in our period, many people lamented this for a variety of reasons. What we discovered is that it is not nearly so simple. As Bob points out in the essay, the way in which the book as a physical artifact, the way in which it is put together by publishers, is what is important to look at. This is a period in which we have abridgments of novels. And those abridgments offer main plot which allows a reader to move at breakneck speed, extensive reading with a vengeance. But those same publishers are also publishing anthologies, 
taken from various reflections in fiction, and it is those reflections that are published in anthologies that call readers to a more close reading experience, to intensive reading, and to the commonplacing that frequently accompanied historically intensive reading. So two major contributions in volume two. And then there's the issue of interventions, or what David asked, how does the history of the book, and specifically, in my case, volume two, speaking today, change what we consider to be crucial or critical knowledge about the decades from 1790 to 1840? The history of the book challenges, complicates, revises, expands our understanding of key fields, and I think we'll see this across all five volumes. In volume two, I'm gonna to point to three important interventions in time, simply means I can only point to three. One, political history. After John Brooks' essay, we will look upon political history and, I might add, emerging sectionalism, which will eventually divide the nation to the point of a civil war, we'll look at differently. Following the lead of a couple of other scholars who have focused on newspapers, Brooke challenges two widely accepted premises about the relationship between print and politics. First, that the nation's weekly newspapers, which constituted the largest body of print in the decades from 1790 to 1840, were rhetorically accessible to all literate individuals. And second, that they reached nearly all of those who were newly enfranchised, which is basically all dealt white, white males. Those premises did prove to be accurate for New England and the Middle Atlantic. Galvanized by increasingly heated battles between Federalists and Republicans, printers in those two regions founded hundreds of newspapers beginning in the 1790s, and eventually they secured millions of readers. However, and this is an important point, the increased exposure to print was sectional. Brooks shows that relative scarcity persisted in the South throughout these decades, and accessibility, which was linked to a particular rhetorical practice, also varied by region. Instead of appealing to all voters, Southern editors continued to practice Republican conventions, most, no most notably the classical mode of rational deliberation and consensus rehearsed by members of the region's economic and political elite. Indeed, Southerners took decades to adopt the more accessible vernacular style of the partisan press which emerged in the North in the years between the passage of the Alien Sedition Acts and Jefferson's election in 1800. And so what did voters do there? They were enfranchised. And here again, it's the persistence that is important. They relied more on oral culture, the large majority of voters. The raucous election days, the stump speeches, the plentiful barbecue and booze, that remained. Now, the question that we did not address because it doesn't become central until after 1840 is what does this do in terms of our understanding of an emerging and more and more powerful and accelerating sectionalism that will eventually divide the nation? Religious history, and I'm very glad that David Nord is able to be here today. David's benevolent books. What he does in a remarkable essay is show us how those benevolent books those tracts, those pamphlets, those memoirs, those matters evangelical, stood in an oppositional relationship to the nation's commercial markets and the profits they generated. Tracts, periodicals, Bibles circulated by evangelical reformers were given to readers. They did try to collect a token payment, but the main point is that voluntary associations and local auxiliaries sought readers independent of the needs of commerce. Was the message unpopular? All the more reason to see that it found its way into hands of readers. Three practices distinguished those who sought nothing less than the nation's conversion and a global millennium. First, they yoked with their anti-commercial ends, entrepreneurial means. They practiced the principles of centralization for economies of scale in the production and localization and distribution. Simultaneously, they reversed yet another fundamental principle, which linked supply to demand. Local auxiliaries of national organizations raised the monies and paid the costs of printing tracts, periodicals, Bibles. Then, instead of adapting supply to demand, as commerce would do, the auxiliaries dispensed their print to everyone, perhaps without the means, perhaps without the inclination to read this material. 
Then there's also, I think, an important point about, that links us to politics and print. They were determined to, in a sense, foil the market, to drive demand, and they adopted that hortatory rhetoric that is familiar to readers of the highly competitive partisan press that emerged in the North. But the opposition was not another political party, but another literary genre. I think one of the reasons that we see fiction is perhaps more crucial than it may well be from the perspective of the history of the book is the way in which the benevolent books and the benevolent empire looked upon fiction. It was the most dangerous and deplorable part of literature and had to be very much challenged. Finally, the third, African American history. African American history and its relationship, not to mention its relevance to the history of the book and vice versa, have received relatively little consideration, at least until Gray Gundicker's splendid essay. It's a highly original, remarkably fine essay in which she shows that African Americans deployed literacy and print in a sustained and sustaining challenge mounted against slavery and discrimination. Focusing on what she calls three networks of activity, Gundiker introduces us to three intersecting strategies, all of which appropriated print in a struggle against oppression. First, freeborn and formerly enslaved African Americans challenged charges of intellectual inferiority with tangible demonstrations of achievement designed to legitimate their demands for liberation and rights. Second, they made the past a resource for the present and the future. Celebrating a renowned history that included an Egyptian civilization with which Europeans identified and European Americans, African Americans proudly cited the French intellectual C.F. Bolney's de declaration, the first learned nation was a nation of blacks. Testimonies recording a wide array of accomplishments, past and present, appeared in a host of genres, including newspapers, spiritual autobiographies, pamphlets, slave narratives, and magazine articles. Third, and finally, in claiming the technologies of literacy and print for themselves, African Americans adapted the vernacular practices to alphabetic literacy and incorporated conventions of inscription and interpretation, which they had brought from Africa. The final point I want to make, and then I'll be concluded, is the point that Joni made and um, David took. <laughs> and that's <laughs> I'm introducing it. <laughs> And that is, I think it's central to all of us who makes a book. I mean, I think that's the, the sort of leitmotif that we all are talking about today. Who makes a book? And we want to talk about the host of actors who make the book. And I think as a collaborative enterprise, we've all learned from each other in that regard. Thank you. Like my colleagues, I would like to start with a few thank yous on behalf of Jeff Groves, Michael Winship, Steve Nissenbaum, and myself. Um, a thank you, first of all, to Caroline Sloat, who did more than any other person to make sure this whole series, including our volume, came to fruition and came to fruition so, what we think so well. Um, I, think, I think Caroline deserves a round of applause, actually, for everything she's done. I would also like to thank the, the people of University of North Carolina Press, the people of the American Antiquarian Society, uh, our 18 marvelous contributors, some of whom, like Barbara Sitcherman, had signed on from the very beginning in the 1990s, some of whom joined the team late in the game, but all of whom were phenomenally willing to continue revising their essays in various ways as we crafted a narrative for volume three. I'd also like to thank the editors of the other volumes, several of whom answered questions for us along the way about how to approach this enterprise and how to make this enterprise connect with, with theirs, because the idea, in some sense, is to, connect, to create a connected history of the book in America, not five volumes that are completely separate from one another. In an age of rapidly changing technologies of reading, publishing, authorship, distribution, and the like, 
like our own age, in some ways the history of the book in America offers historical perspectives on very contemporary questions, ranging from the technologies of the word, the relation, as we might call it today, between the platform and the content for all involved in the process, to the very meanings attached to the concept of reading itself. Thinking about volume three, I was put in mind of a recent book, actually the recent Pulitzer Prize winning book by Daniel Walker Howe, What Hath God Wrought, which spans the period from volume two into volume three, from roughly 1815 to 1848. And, and Howe argues, I think very persuasively, that crucial transformations in America during that period, the years crossing these two volumes, lay in transportation and communications. And I think that the history of the book in America, these volumes, both synthesize and advance our understanding of those changes, especially the changes in communication, and, and certainly suggest how those changes were not linear or one-dimensional. A term that, that both David and Mary have used in, in their presentations is the term the book trades, plural. I think one of, the, one of the contributions of volume three is to think about how that plural becomes a singular for at least some people involved in the process. At the beginning of our period, that is 1840, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to talk about the book trade as an entity or a phenomenon understood as such in the singular by those who participated in it. By 1876, that had changed, as we see when representatives of the book trade assemble at the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia, calling themselves just that. And this is, in many ways, the central story of A History of the Book, Volume 3, The Industrial Book. And it is, I think, in this book that that story is told for the first time in a connected way, at the same time that Volume 3 recognizes something else. They, that at the, as publishers and book distributors and even retail booksellers across the United States recognize themselves as part of something they called the trade, at the very same time, there were multiple other book trades continuing to exist, whether they were the subscription book trade, the religious book enterprise, the music book enterprise, an educational publishing enterprise, or many more that were regional or local. So as we thought about the genesis or the, the ideas behind volume three, what came together for us as one of five major arguments was the emergence and solidification of the book trade. What did that mean, the book trade, or as it was called at the time by some, the book trade system, whose its fundamental element was publishers' discounted sales to dedicated retailers a system that linked publishers to booksellers across the nation, often through wholesale dealers known as jobbers. This was made possible or facilitated in part by improved mechanisms of transportation, credit, and marketing. And by the 1870s, publishers and booksellers understood themselves as the trade in a way they hadn't 35 years earlier. At the same time, our volume traces at least three other strands and a fourth countervailing strand throughout this period. One of those is the strand implicated by our indicated by our title, the industrial book. That is, the manufactured material artifact, the product of an increasingly industrialized system that we see developing over the course of our period. And Michael Winship's essay in particular on manufacturing brings those connections together in a, in a way for the first time that we have seen in print. Another theme is the, qu the question of the American book. What does the American book mean in our period? We have to go back, of course, to the period of volume two to hear Sidney Smith's famous question in the four corners of the globe, who reads an American book? In our period, I think it's possible to say, or at least our volume claims, that the notion of the American book developed in at least two ways. One of them was the development of American themes and topics within books that were published, ranging from themes related to Native Americans to themes of the American landscape and so on. This is, of course, the period often described as the American Renaissance. 
But the other notion of the American book that we try to explore in this volume is the notion of books made in America that might not necessarily be about America at all. When we think about the series of books that Tickner and Fields published, we have to think about their series of Dickens and De Quincey, not just their series of Hawthorne or Longfellow. So that the idea of the American book is not just an idea about American authorship, but also about American material production of texts that were not necessarily American authored at all. The fourth major theme, in addition to the notion of a national book trade system, the industrial book and the American book, is the ways in which print, print culture, books, magazines, and other forms of print came to help consolidate values that we think of as centered on the middling classes. And here, essays like Barbara Seacherman's book, uh, essay about reading, and Louise Stevenson's essay about material artifacts associated with books, essentially literary material culture in the middle class home, help us to see how print culture helped to suffuse middle class values within American society. As I said, there is a fifth theme in this book, and is the, it is the theme that cuts across all four of the others. And I think here I would echo David and Mary on the, on the relationships between change and persistence. For example, at the same time we see the emergence of a national book trade system, we, we see the continued production of newspapers and other kinds of print, many of them ephemeral, at the local level. It's not just a story of nationalization. It's a story that cuts back and forth. John Nerone's essay on newspapers shows this in remarkable ways, the ways in which we see the persistence of the local in newspapers, but also, by 1880, the emergence of national system within those newspapers. The fact that syndication makes content and even certain inside pages common to some newspapers across the country. Wire services serve a similar function. So if these were the five major themes of volume three, I'd like to say something also about some of the challenges we faced in pursuing this volume. I think one of the greatest was the challenge of periodization itself. What is it about 1840 to 1880 that makes those the logical dates to periodize some part of the history of books in America? And the answer, as Jeff and Michael and Steve and I kept coming up against in our meetings. We met in Reno, we met in California, we met in Texas, we met in Vermont, and we kept asking this question, what is it about 1840 and 1880? And ultimately, the answer was, not much. <laughs> that, is, that is, is there some development that begins in 1840? Is there something that ends in 1880 that is intrinsic to book history? No. Not really. In fact, we kept stumbling across 1880. We knew we couldn't much go past 1880 because Carl and Jan would not be pleased with us if we did, <laughs> nor would the essayists in their volume. But we also knew that so many of the stories in our volume continue into the next volume, whether it's the story of copyright, for which the operative date change would probably be 1891, the, t the date of the international copyright. Or, in the field of technology, also slightly later than 1880, the invention of the linotype machine, which in some ways completes the story of the industrial book by applying industrialization and mechanization to composition. But of course, both of those were beyond the scope of our volume, and so all we could do was say in last paragraphs of various chapters, this is a story for another volume. The other challenge of periodization in our volume, the glaring challenge for anybody who hears the dates 1840 and 1880, is the challenge of the Civil War. Did we want an essay specifically about the Civil War and American print culture? Did we want all of our contributors somehow to address the Civil War in their essays on various topics? If not all of them, which ones? How many of them? And we continued to wrestle with this, these questions all the way through. We never did have, and I think we made sort of a decision not to have an essay separately on the Civil War. We did, however, encourage contributors whose stories, whose book history stories, somehow connected to the Civil War, 
to at least, men at least to mention it, and in some cases to emphasize it. For example, in the history of newspapers, the Civil War is an important event. In the history of Southern reading and production of print, as Amy Thomas tells it, the Civil War is inescapable, given what we know about how the war changed Southern print. In the essay by Janine de Lombard on African American reading, in some ways, Reconstruction is a more important milestone than the Civil War. We ended up, in other words, not having a separate essay on the Civil War. We recognize that's a problem in the introduction. We go back to it in the conclusion. We know, for example, that the Civil War consolidated or helped consolidate many of the developments that we describe in this volume, the industrial book. After all, the Civil War helps to consolidate an American industrial society. It also, in some ways, renders the South neo-colonial, and we can see that in the story of book history as well, as the paper industry moves south for the raw materials and for the, war, the relatively cheaper labor force. We can see, in other words, in the story of print culture, some of the larger developments of our period, or as we often lamented, past our period. David asked us, as he, was, as he emailed us about what we might discuss here, what kinds of stories are there still to tell? And in particular, what happens to the international dimension of American book history, or of book history in general, in this series called The History of the Book in America? And I will say that in our volume, the international dimension comes up only sporadically. One place in which it does is Jeff Groves' essay on the exports and imports of American books in the, from the 1840s to the 1870s. And in a remarkable set of tables in our volume, derived from the United States' Commerce and Navigation volumes of the, of the Congressional Serial Set, Jeff has put together the numbers, the values of US exports in dollars of books and other printed matter to various nations around the world. And as I read these nations, you might notice something. Argentina, Belgium, Brazil, Chile, China, Colombia, Denmark, Dominican Republic, France, Germany, Hawaiian Islands, Italy, Japan, Mexico, Netherlands, Peru, Russia, Spain, Sweden, and Norway, Texas, but only before it became a state, Turkey, the United Kingdom, including Canada and other British possessions, Uruguay, Venezuela, other Central and South America. One of the things that, that stands out in that list is the number of Latin American nations on it. And I think, and, and Jeff and I talked about this beforehand, uh, before I spoke today, that this tells a story or begins to hint at a story yet untold. If the history of books in America as a transatlantic phenomenon has been told in part by volume one and has been emphasized by many scholars who think about the transatlantic exchange of books and ideas, a story that might not have been told to this point is a more hemispheric story, a story of the exchange of books and ideas between the United States and Latin America a story that we leave it to other volumes and probably future scholars to discover and to tell in richer ways. And so, as a way of concluding, I think it's worth saying that a history of the book, of the book in America, this series that all of us have been part of, represents the state of our knowledge and of our understanding at a particular moment. It also, I think, acts as an invitation or an entree to future scholars to build upon this work and to venture into parts of book history that we've not yet barely begun to explore. Thanks. While we were working on this project, uh, David, often urged us to strive for uh, a similarity of tone. And I find, being last of <laughs> the panelists, that we have achieved that. Uh, and, and also, as my remarks will soon demonstrate, um, as well as a certain uh, overlap in content. 
but at any rate, I am here representing my co-editors, David Nord and Michael Shudson, and I first want to reiterate the lovely, moving conclusion to our acknowledgments page that Dave wrote, in which he observed that the deepening friendship the three of us attained over the course of this project was one of the most delightful, actually, Dave, you said the most delightful and unexpected reward of our interest in the history of the book in America. I suppose that the life cycle events that the editorial board, editorial board experienced during the period that we work together on this project are those that attend any long undertaking. But we did witness the death of parents, the marriage of children, the arrival of grandchildren, uh, divorce, new relationships, uh, uh, all, all that, as I said, what I suppose one would expect, um, uh, and certainly uh, the passing of, of Hugh Amory, and in, the, in volume five, the passing of three of our contributors. Um, but uh, still, even if uh, this may have been predictable, it, it means that as I stand here before you, I'm marking not only uh, the completion of our intellectual work, but also uh, I'm reflecting back on the human connections that we forged uh, along the way. David did send us these questions, though, and one of them used the word connections, intellectual connections, and so I've taken up that one. He asked us to consider uh, the connections that emerge from our pages. Volume 5 has received one review already. It's a glowing review, I'm happy to say, and so I was able to draw on it in answering this question about connections, but the author did observe that we didn't have to, we didn't seem to have a, what he called a strong argumentative line. Then he complimented us by saying that, of course, that was a sensible and logical decision. It must have been a conscious decision, and it was sensible, because who would draw conclusions about a history that is still unfolding? Um, so I'll just take the compliment, though. I will say that we thought a lot about whether we needed a stronger argumentative line, and in the end, I think our review was, your reviewer was right that we made a decision that it was too early to adopt one. But we did adopt some themes, and we did make some connections. And the first to highlight, um, as Michael suggested to me, is captured in what Michael calls our brazen title, The Enduring Book, because uh, here we are in a period of um, Kindles and iPads and other technological innovations, and yet we argue that um, alongside these important technological changes of the last 60 or so years, Changes which surely have, as we show, affected the production, distribution, and reception of print, there remains the book itself. And we do postulate that the book is likely to remain, at least for the immediate future. Uh, Michael wrote that, you know, fortunately, we don't have to look ahead to the next 60 years, so we can still use that title, the enduring book, at least for now. We note especially the essay by our contributor, John Thompson, who, writing about academic publishing in the digital age, uh, observes that we have witnessed what he calls a revolution in process, not a revolution in product. Um, that is, the academic book, as Kate Torrey, I know, will attest, still does survive in the, di in the digital age, though sometimes uh, in a parallel digital form. Similarly, Although our contributor, Linda Scott, provocatively faults publishers for failing to develop a more flexible and responsive uh, a sense of uh, what she calls consumer expertise that might have enabled publishers to develop uh, uh, better uh, strategies for their products, we note the growth in our period 
of both bookstores and the wares they purvey. Michael and Dave both sent me back to the tables in our volume, which show, for example, five times as many bookstores in 2002 as in 1963, five times as many new titles in 2005 as in 1985. And so we feel that we're on firm ground in saying, yes, the enduring book. And I think also that we have the enduring reader. We note in our volume the recent dismaying NEA study that charts a decline in literary or voluntary reading among the American public in the year since 1992. And yet, here we are in the Library of Congress, and gathering in this building reminds me of something that I used in my own essay um, on reading in our volume, and that is a speech that Daniel Borston gave in 1979 when he was the Librarian of Congress. In his remarks, he celebrated, though he also worried a little, about what he called the autonomous reader, a reader seeking knowledge as a, quote, free and active spirit. In our volume, by tracing the histories of libraries, book clubs, and other reading communities, we underscore the social dimension even of private reading. And yet we maintain that despite the admittedly worrisome NEA data, Borston's fear that television or other forms of popular entertainment would eradicate the autonomous reader, that fear has not become a reality, nor do we think it is likely to. A second theme of our volume, a second set of connections within it, is one that uh, Dave Nord deserves enormous credit for, and that is the large role of subvention or subsidy in determining the forms of print produced in our period. By exploring government subsidy of both literacy, education, and publication, as well as the histories of non-commercial print production, we make clear one of the assumptions that informed the discussions at our very early HBA editorial board meetings, uh, which were, I want to say, funded by the NEH, because I think we have an NEH uh, person here today, right? Yes? Right. So um, I, do, I do remember those very fondly. <laughs> And I want to thank the endowment. I, I've, I've become a humanities lobbyist for uh, New York State, so this is now something that comes uh, easily to my lips, but I, I really mean it. Um, at any rate, the, one of the things that we kicked around, and many of you will remember this, was that the history of the book must recognize not the role of the market, but rather multiple markets, not solely the most visible commercial ones. And I think you've heard echoes of that uh, in the remarks of my colleagues as well. Our theme of subvention also reflects our use of and contribution to a key insight that historians of the book have afforded us. And this is the point that David um, so can I say preempted and that Mary echoed and that now I'm going to say one more time, and that is that no text arrives in the hands of readers without mediation. In our volume, we examine mediation in the guise of literary critics and librarians, religious publishers and magazine editors, textbook committees, and scientific experts. Whether we can now write a credible, complete literary or intellectual history without accounts of mediation is, I think, thus open to question. Certainly, there are mediators who did not appear in our volume. David asked us whether there was a reason why we didn't have much about the material book, and I think the reason is um, not clear to me. Book illustrators uh, sh probably should have received a chapter, um, and uh, others involved in the production of, uh, of that material object. Uh, certainly, that's a dimension that I hope scholars of the future will add to what we've done. Um, we, but uh, to, to um, 
to recoup uh, or, or, or to make up for that lapse, let me just say that we do talk uh, about the paperback form, of course, the spread of the paperback in our period. And we also have an interesting chapter uh, on book collectors, uh, coveters of the book in its material form. Finally, a third theme of our volume is one that we share with volume four and uh, with the others even covering the earlier periods, and Scott alluded to this too. And that is the coexistence of consolidation and multiplicity, of centralized control and independence, of international publishing conglomerates that still leave space for small presses and oppositional voices. It is in this respect, perhaps, that HBA perhaps makes the biggest difference. Like the entire field of the history of the book, it furnishes a model of how culture works that replaces any simple story of relentless monolithic forces or hard and fast cultural hierarchies. Think again here in these precincts of Daniel Borston in one light, the Harvard-trained epitome of consensus history. Yet, in the remarks I quoted, Borson is urging readers to listen to no guide but themselves, to achieve autonomy by escaping to what he calls a private island in order to read for pleasure. Borson is a mediator of print, as is the institution, this library over which he presided, and the government that funds it. But his prescription for autonomy, uh, even for a kind of renegade reading, tells us that we have no simple story here of elites imposing their values on a passive or even on a resisting public. Preparing these remarks, I remembered how the pioneering historian of the book, William Charvat, when he got all done, decided that, after all, uh, perhaps he should have stuck to the text. <laughs> and I worried, uh, because David's question was, have we made a difference? I think we all worried, whoa, what if we really haven't made a difference? But I think that Charvet made a difference, and that he was wrong if, to question whether or not he had. Um, and that so have we. Uh, since David stole my point about mediation, I'm going to steal a word that he told me in our prior conversation, uh, uh, and that was that we have created a plateau, that at the very least we have created a floor, um, and we have raised that plateau far above where William Charvat had it, and perhaps we even have now erected a scaffolding or a partial edifice on this plateau, and in that way we have um, pr produced, if not a, a sort of a monument, at least uh, some kind of structure for the future. And that's sort of the end, except that this morning I said to Scott, you know, I've written out my remarks. I did that because after David and I talked on the phone, I thought, oh my god, I better write something. So that's why it's handwritten. Um, um, <laughs> but uh, but um, uh, I, I said to Scott, well, I've, I've done this, but I haven't actually written the last sentence. And then I said, well, so maybe I'll just do what Gertrude Stein did at the end of the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas. If you uh, remember, Stein writes, um, Alice, you are never going to write that autobiography, so I am going to write it for you. And then she says, and I have, and this is it. <laughs> but, our, but our version, to paraphrase Stein, would be, you are never going to finish that massive history of the book in America. But we have, and this is it. Thank you. <laughs>